Hello and welcome to another Workonomy discussion where we uncover and find solutions to common pain points business owners new and old face in their entrepreneurial journeys. I'm Jason Eisenberg, your Community Program Manager, and today we have a very focused interview with Brittany Crystal uh, about being an industry influencer and how to properly leverage the must-use platform called LinkedIn. We'll go into why LinkedIn's must-use, whether you're looking for a position or trying to establish your personal brand for your business. Brittany is a professional brand and growth expert. She's a non-practicing lawyer and hosts a top-rated podcast called Beyond Influential, five stars through and through, uh, where she goes one-on-one -on -one with thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and creatives, and they discuss how to leverage industry influence consumption. Now, remember, if you get something out of this, you learn something, you can go back to our Facebook group, the Workonomy Facebook group, where you can find 13 other discussions we've had that are prompted by you, the business owner, asking questions on how to work through these obstacles. You can go to our Facebook group, our LinkedIn group, or you can go to Office Depot's YouTube channel to check out all the videos. So without further ado, please bring your digital hands together for Brittany Crystal. We now have Brittany Crystal on with us. Hi, Brittany. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This is so cool. Oh, you beat me to the punch. I always wanted to, I already, I wrote that, like, thank you 31 times over. I know how busy of a person you are. Um, I know you've got your podcast, which by the way, uh, I've, I've listened to about 15 of the last episodes. Um, and well, I'm, I'm hooked. So I'm hooked. And honestly, I'll be honest, my favorite episodes that you do are the ones of just you. Um, I really like learning about your journey and it's partially why you're here to actually talk about your journey and what you've learned uh, along the way. So um, before we actually get started, uh, can you tell us a little about how you have ended up where you are? So where I am now is not where I started. We actually went to high school together. For I know. Like, I don't know if you uh, preface that. I actually went to school. It was either doctor or lawyer. That was kind of the option for me. And I was always a good student. I was good, you know, good at reading and writing. I really actually wanted to be in the entertainment industry. I was super interested in television. I wanted to decide what went on TV. And my parents told me the safe route would be to become an entertainment lawyer. Hmm. So I went that route. I went to Georgetown for law school. I passed the bar in New York. I thought that's where I, I'm based in LA right now. I thought that's what I was meant to do. And during the time in law school, I knew it wasn't for me. And I basically muscled through, knew that I, nobody could ever take that degree away from me. Nobody could ever take that license away from me. And then once I was done with that, I was like, okay, what do you really want to do? And so then I ended up working in Hollywood. I worked in Hollywood for around four years doing if you're not familiar with Hollywood, there's a whole structure and a hierarchy that no matter where you come from, you start as an assistant. And around this time, social media was happening, but it wasn't, TV was still the big deal. Like Facebook was around, but Instagram hadn't started yet. This was like 2010. Netflix so didn't have originals, a, right? Like they didn't have their own original content yet. Yeah. Oh no, none <laughs> of the Netflix didn't. I don't, maybe Netflix existed, but they were sending, you know, DVDs. To oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very different world. So I worked at a big Hollywood agency, a management company. And at this time, reality TV was was kind of big. And I noticed that that was a faster pace. And, and so I worked at a production company and I ended up working at the Lifetime Network. And just none of those jobs really suited me. They weren't, they weren't the right fit. I wasn't, it wasn't a meritocracy. It just wasn't the industry for me. And mm -hmm. so I started studying for the GMAT to go to business school because I heard if I wanted to work in marketing and branding that I needed to go to business school, which is total crap. <laughs> At <that> time. <laughs> but I thought it was true because I knew, I, I knew what was working in television. Like I knew it. Like I could read a script or I could meet someone or talk to a writer director and I intuitively knew what was working, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to apply that into a profession that made money. And so during the time when I was doing all the TV stuff and working at the Lifetime Network and doing reality TV, my focus just naturally was starting to shift towards social. I noticed I was paying attention to my phone. I wasn't watching TV like I used to. So basically, I don't know if your viewers know who Gary Vaynerchuk is. I hope, you, I hope they do. <laughs> Let's just say I hope they do. If not, you should check him out. Yeah. But he owns the digital agency out of New York. You can look him up. It's kind of a big deal in the marketing and social space. And somebody sent me a Gary Vaynerchuk tweet just saying that he was opening up an L.A. office. I had no clue who he was. This was in 2014 when I was miserable in entertainment. And they were just like, you don't need to go to business school. Look into this. 
And basically, I applied through the website, ended up getting my foot in the door, met Gary at the Christmas party four months in, and the next month he came back and was like, you're overqualified for what you do. What do you really want to do? And over the next, and then he asked me if I'd consider moving to New York. I'm trying to pick up the pace with the story. <laughs> and uh, really, this was in 2014 on, into 2015. He basically was, gave me an offer where he was like, listen, I think you know something about influence. I'm about to get really serious about my personal brand. At the time, we were planning for his, uh, I think it was his fourth book, uh, that hashtag Ask Gary Vee book. He mm -hmm. was like, that's coming out in March of 2016. I want that to be a number one New York Times bestseller. I'm going to get really serious. Come out, give me a year. So I moved out to New York, and that was October 2015. And basically over the next I don't know, year and a half, I learned everything that there is to learn about building a personal brand online. I completely fell in love with it very quickly. I My whole intention of going to New York was to, I thought I was going to pitch him a startup idea. I thought I wanted to invest his money. Uh. I thought, okay, I'm going to go learn everything I possibly can. And at the end of my year, I'm going to pitch him an idea and he's going to invest. And three months in, I was like, hold on. I love what I'm doing. How do I turn this into a business? And at the time, he he now has a personal branding arm of the agency called Vayner Talent. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was coming or in the pipeline because he tests everything out on himself. So as soon as I knew that that was happening, I asked him, like, I want to do this as soon as this is a reality. So I worked on the Vayner Talent arm, the personal brand arm from 2016 during the time I was with him up until May 2017. And then I took off on my own and I've been building out my own business. Wow. that's So a huge takeaway that I got that I think a lot of people will, would ask, you've probably gotten this question a hundred thousand times, is, you know, you, you <laughs> law school is not easy. Like, I mean, no. I don't think anyone's ever said that. Um, so, uh, you know, knowing that you were unhappy doing it, uh, what pushed you to finish the degree, take the bar, pass the bar, a lawyer who, who <laughs> focuses on getting their degree is probably like, this is all I'm going to do now for the next 20 years. But you were so yeah. open to like something new. Well, a lot of people do get stuck in that trap. And I'm going to tell you now, my mindset now, and for everyone listening, because of the internet, literally everything is possible. Everything you could possibly want as a result, clients, money, attention, opportunities, brand deals, all of these different things are completely available to you now. And when I was you know, graduating law school in 2010, that wasn't exactly the case. The internet exists, but it wasn't like it, like it is. My parents were like, oh my God, what are you going to do? Pretty much at that point, I was so miserable, so miserable at my summer jobs. And I think it was because I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer or something sexy and the economy was tanking during that time. The thought of every day going, I was crying. I'm not an emotional person, but literally I was crying every wage every day driving to a job where I had a secretary 30 years older than me and I was getting paid very good money. And I was like, this cannot be my life. And I had that realization early and I'm very lucky I did because I think a lot of people kind of get complacent that things are, you know, it's okay. It's maybe not the best, but you're not supposed to be happy where you work. Right. It was just such a point where it was so miserable. It was like, there's no, there has to be another option. And if I'm a good enough student to have graduated, I graduate early from college, and, you know, to have this degree, I'm smart enough to figure out another way. I don't know what it is yet, mm. but I'm young enough and smart enough to, to come up with something. I, th I think that's key, too, is just not is not accepting the norm of like, oh, yeah, you're supposed to hate your job and then you go home and do what you love. Right. But unfortunately, life and work are intrinsically connected. I mean, I don't care what you say. If you had a bad day at work, it's pretty hard to shut that off when you get home. So it's very hard. Right. Um, okay. So thank you for that story. Super inspiring. I've already heard it, but I wanted you to share that story. But I do want to say real fast for the people who are later on, cause I get both sides in my business. I get people coming to me who are early on in their career and you know, there are people who are concerned that they're not experts and those people should not pretend to be experts. There's a different strategy for them. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who are starting their entrepreneurial journey or their business later on. You still have so much time. There's so much time. It wasn't because I was, you know, 21 years old at the time right. that I realized I had so much time. If you're 41, you have so much time right now. So I just want to put that out there that this isn't an age thing. 
Gotcha. It, it, yeah, it's more of a mentality. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to start talking. I think this is such a great topic because we haven't covered this with Workonomy is, um, you know, I influencers. I mean, personal branding. Um, and so I'm going to start with one question and we'll start like leaking into other areas. But, you know, what is the definition of an industry influencer in, in your book? So an industry influencer to me, everybody has a sphere of influence, but there have always been tastemakers, decision makers. Literally every industry has those people that you look to who are setting the tone. And my philosophy is that you can be one of those people. Like that's just obvious to me, an influencer, when people use the word influencer and it's getting kind of a bad taste in people's mouths now, mm -hmm. they're thinking about someone on Instagram posting, you know, about skinny tea or some kind of product placement. And that's not what it is. Everybody has their own sphere of influence. It's just about, about growing it and cultivating it in the right way that works for you. And I think people can really leverage it. Just to back up for people, my definition of a personal brand is reputation and controlling your story. So everybody has, you know, there are people who come to me and they're like, oh, well, I don't know about, you know, if I wanna build a personal brand, you have a personal brand. Like it's what people are saying about you. You're actually, if you work or you want to work for a living, you're monetizing your name. Somebody mm -hmm. has, people have opinions of your work, but if you're not in control of it, that's your fault. So I kind of take that stance. Gotcha. And, and I just want to also add, you know, this isn't just about like, you know, if you had a business and you wanted to be the expert in, in your industry. Um, if you're also looking for employment, this is super beneficial, correct? A hundred percent. If you're an employee, I've seen it and it, it sucks time and time again, though. You know, one regime change, one manager who doesn't like you. We're in a world where you can really control the opportunities that come in. Let's say you're super happy at your job right now and you have no desire to leave. Mm -hmm. There might only be one other person who's above you who knows about your work product. It's about making sure that other people know it's an insurance policy, but it's also offense. So it's like an offense and defense balance where you should just you should just have it and never need to use it i i, use I like it, that you know, i say it's like a prenup like <laughs> build it when things are good when you're in love and hope that you never need to use it if you're not interested because some people aren't interested in you know putting themselves out there that much and we can talk about tips for those folks too because it's not just for people who you know want to be on camera right like, this is for everybody and everybody needs to be doing it no matter what you do for a living okay gotcha so uh, moving from what an influencer is to what makes a great influencer. I don't know if that if that it's a good segue into some ideas, but that's I mean, my question. <laughs> great influencer influence is based on loyalty and trust. Like that's what it is, and you need people to trust you in your sphere of influence. If I'm talking about, I don't know, like just because I talk about personal branding, hopefully people trust me on that area. But if I recommend to you you know, my organizational system for my socks, maybe that's not what, where my sphere of influence is. But for a lot of people, so for most people, niching down in your sphere of influence is the fastest way to grow your influence, being, having people know right away what to come to you for. And then from there, it grows out. I think I get that question a lot from people about, about whether they niche down or worried about getting pigeonholed. Because honestly, like if you, do trust someone for one thing. Maybe you do want my soft organization tips in you know, six months from now. You don't want any organizational tips from me. I'm just putting that out there. But just in general, it's, that's what it is. It's, it's the trust factor and putting out content or putting yourself in a position that people can trust you in whatever the area is that you are trying to grow your influence in. Right, okay, cool. So how, all right, now we're probably gonna leak into LinkedIn now. Um, because I'm going to ask you, you know, how, how would one go about getting started? Like, let's say today I'm like, I, Jason Eisenberg, your community program manager at, at you know, Workonomy, uh, wants to start gaining more influence. I, I don't know if that's the correct term, but basically, I, okay, wait, real quick. I want to make this distinguishing factor because I've heard it in your podcast. A good influencer does not necessarily mean a whole bunch of followers. Am I, am I right in this? This is 100% the case. It, it does not mean a whole bunch of followers. Really for me, it's about who, it's who you want to be able to convert, but it's about being able to make someone take action. Whether that's liking something, commenting something, if you suggest something, they click on the link. 
It doesn't need to be a sale, but it can be a sale mm -hmm. because there are tons of people who have followers and they can't get their followers to do anything. Right. That's also why buying your followers doesn't make sense. Like that number, brands have been getting a lot smarter about it when we talk about the influencers that are paid to promote something. Because let's say you give it to somebody who has 50,000 followers and then maybe one person clicks on the link and that's the metric that comes back. That <laughs> person doesn't have influence in that area. So you need to be able to back up that influence. I don't know if you've talked about it on this show, The Thousand True Fans. There's a Kevin Kelly essay called A Thousand True Fans. And basically the whole premise is you only need a thousand true fans. Let's say you have a thousand true fans who will buy whatever you sell. You sell something for a hundred bucks. That's, you know, a six figure business right there. Hmm. That's interesting. So, so you know, it's the quality of the follower, not necessarily the quantity. Completely. And that starts small. Like for you, if I was starting, so to back up, I have, I guess I'll call them my three laws. And this is what I based my LinkedIn course off of. And there are three laws to branding in general. Mm -hmm. And like for anybody building their brand, this is what's important. The first is clarity. And that's, there's internal clarity. That's knowing who you are, knowing who you want to speak to, knowing your goals. There's external clarity, which is making sure that that translates on social platforms or on the internet, and that comes across. Then there's consistent content, and then there's community. So, and that's the engagement piece. So all of those together build a brand. So when it comes to where to build the brand, that's the next question, but those pieces, those three pieces need to be everywhere. So for you building your brand, I would start with a clarity piece and figuring out not only who you are, but who you're speaking to. Your mm -hmm. audience matters a lot. So you're speaking to, you know, certain types of business owners. Where are those people? And for me, a lot of those people are on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, right. and we can go into why I like LinkedIn so much in general, but you got to go where your audience is. You know, like if you're, if your demographic for whatever reason is, you know, 55 and over, you're not going to Snapchat, right? <laughs> you're not go you know, you're going to be using Facebook or maybe Instagram, definitely LinkedIn on that, especially if they're business owners of a certain age, but it's about knowing who you're going after and what you want. And then, and then working on that, it right. all starts with you. So this is about knowing your business because for most people listening, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a small business owner, and you have a product of some kind, and you don't know who your audience is, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> backing up just entirely on that, you definitely need clarity on, I think it's interesting to get clarity on not only who you are and who you like talking to, because that's probably where your business lies, but for the most part, you should be talking to people online and, and checking it out. Like I said, if you're a business owner at this point, you know who that person is. In any course that I do and in any one-on-ones that I do, it is the most intense almost therapy session of digging into who you actually are as a person mm -hmm. because you do need to answer those questions about not only who you are, but what's your vision 10 years from now? What do you want to really be known for? All of the things that maybe you don't want to even discuss publicly, you need to have those conversations with yourself or someone like me to help figure it out. And then based on your product or what your business is, you kind of reverse engineer that. And for the audience, for the audience, there's a, I have it in the course, but just in general, there's a clarity piece for that where you get so granular that you're talking to one single person. The goal with an audience is really to pick that one person that you're speaking to. And it's amazing how the more niche down you get and who you speak to, the more broad reaching you go and the more growth you see it's hmm. super counterintuitive it does seem like that yeah but take time sometimes depending on if you're super early and maybe you don't know maybe you talk to two types of people and then see who's responding to you for the most part though people are on instagram they're on linkedin they're you know where they are right like you just know where they are they're not hiding under some rock <laughs> Got it. Okay, cool. So we're going to go into some LinkedIn and I think this is really important because a lot of people don't, don't use it uh, or they don't use it correctly. Um, and, and I was one of those people a year ago. I mean, I thought it was a place solely for looking for jobs. That's it. I had my, you know, I had my resume looking profile up, maybe a picture of me wearing a nice, you know, suit and that was it. Um, but you know what? I never went on it because I never, had got prompted to go on it and I, I didn't have any notifications or anything 
But uh, this year has been such a big year of growth for me just personally on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has changed so much. The way you were using it, that makes so much sense to me because that's the way I was using it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not one of these people. There are a few people on LinkedIn who are like, I've been using LinkedIn for 15 years every day and now, <laughs> and now things are happening. For me, I had, you know, I had a LinkedIn in law school so I could get a legal job. But, and then I would change, you know, I'd update my resume every time I needed to leave a job. Yes. That was the only time I used LinkedIn. And I started paying more attention to it. So just for context, when I worked for Gary, I needed to be able to watch any piece of content and pull content from that content. Like basically make, if I had a 30 minute video, I needed to be able to pull two clips, write an article, 10 image quotes, and be able to optimize on all platforms. Mm -hmm. So I needed to be aware of what was going on in every platform, who's on every platform, general demographic information, how to talk to people on different platforms differently. So be native to the platform. So LinkedIn was really like a second. It was something we knew there was a corporate audience there of some kind. So we'd throw something up. Mm -hmm. And since that time, since leaving Vayner, I'd say since 2017, LinkedIn has completely changed. It's now not just a corporate audience. It's not what you think. It works for literally every industry I can possibly think of. Um, I'm talking like from makeup artists to like the kind of like blogger influencer all the way to any kind of entrepreneur up and down the scale. Yes, of course, there's corporate recruiters there too. So in 2016, my, Microsoft acquired LinkedIn and basically what happened since then is they've shifted their focus to content creation, which is incredible because basically their business model is in order for LinkedIn to make money, they need to sell ad space, like Facebook sells ads, they need to sell ads and premium tools. And they can't do that unless they have people who are actually there consuming content and using the platform. Right. So content creation became a focus. They introduced native video for people who don't realize that you can post videos directly from your LinkedIn app onto LinkedIn. That's now a thing. Mm -hmm. That's a huge game changer. Link, I mean, it's been so huge. And then LinkedIn has, it has the friendliest, most straightforward algorithm of any platform right now. Super low barriers to entry because people aren't used to making content like this on LinkedIn. So right now there's a ton of attention. It's something, there's like a crazy stat, like out of all of the active, so there's like half a billion people on LinkedIn in general, mm -hmm. but out of the active folks who actually are making content, it's like less than 1% of people are actually making content and those people are getting all of the attention. And so even just doing minimal work on LinkedIn right now, which is why I love it for people who are super busy because I specialize in people who don't have time to be on the internet all the time, mm -hmm. it doesn't take much work to get visibility. And that's why it's amazing for anybody who is trying to grow their brand or grow influence because it really, I definitely spend less than an hour a week and you really don't need to spend much time. And the people that are on there are people who drive business decisions. It's the number one platform for lead gen. 44% of people on the platform make over $75,000. The money is there and people are migrating back. It's like a Facebook or Instagram five or six years ago, the way people talk about, mm -hmm. oh, I missed the boat, I wish I got in early. I've never seen this from an incumbent platform. It's insane that it's happening right now and everybody listening should take advantage. Absolutely, yes, um, <laughs> for sure. And I, I love that you're sharing that because you know, a, a lot of, I, you know, here I, I wanted to add this compliment in here um, because it's a question too. Uh, so, before I even connected with you on LinkedIn, I, I think we probably have a few people we know, mutual friends, because we went to the same high school. Um, you were probably way cooler than me, so we weren't actually friends. No. <laughs> um, but uh, what I found interesting is that I have seen your hashtags, the like LinkedIn, lo the LinkedIn laws, and I have seen you tagged in tons of other people's stuff all the time. And, and when we connected, it's even more so. Now it's just like, dude, she's all over my feed. But, um, but A, that's a huge testament to what you teach because they're all, all these posts are eager to share their experience or, or their success or whatever it is. They're so eager to talk about it and they wanna tag you to make sure. And then you always respond, you always respond. Um, and I think that's huge. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, that kind of engagement on LinkedIn. Well, thank you. And I always try to, that's a great compliment. 
I think responding, there's so many people just throw out content or they finally put something up and then they don't engage with anybody who has responded to their content. Mm -hmm. It's so important to engage. And some a point I want to make on LinkedIn real fast is for those of you who are not comfortable with content creation, LinkedIn is the only platform where you can actually grow without making content. And this is why you've been seeing so much in my feed and this is why it's so great for everybody listening. If you leave smart comments on people's stuff, that can show up in other people, not only in your network, but in your second and third degree connections. Mm -hmm. So somebody I'm connected to, I might like somebody's post that I'm connected to who would be relevant to you and their post will show up in your feed. So you're getting more than just the people you're connected to. Um, I just think it's so important. I mean, engagement's so important. I know people talk about that, but especially on on LinkedIn, take take ten minutes. You're gonna waste ten minutes in the bathroom, <laughs> wherever, on the train, in whatever city you're in. I'm not just listen. I'm being realistic. And go, you know, you're consuming the content anyway. Leave a thoughtful comment. Right. Like something. Share something. People come back. The just the act, the reciprocity factor is very real, especially if somebody isn't, you know, isn't famous and doesn't have, you know, a million people following them. They want to respond. I want to engage. I want, if people are listening to my podcast or take the time to write something to me, why wouldn't, it's my business. Why wouldn't I want to, you know, say something back? Right. Especially on LinkedIn because it is, it's most likely related to your business. This is a different type of consumer. These people directly are interested in the things that you're talking about and doing and maybe if they're not you know maybe if you're a plumber and I don't need a plumber right now I might need a plumber or you know somebody else is having a conversation with me I'll know like oh you should talk to that guy right and who knows that plumber might need some personal branding down the line too and then all of a sudden you have this like you said a reciprocity like it's amazing I, I love that and um, it's also why I like LinkedIn a lot right now because um, it's not just B2B, I mean, it is B2B, but I'm just playing with words and I'm saying it's, B2C. It's, it's B2C, but it's also, it's just human to human. Like it's beyond, it's beyond business. And I think that's like the key to personal branding, right? Is that uh, you're not just a business, you're a human being. This is who I am in a genuine form of, you know, this is who I am genuinely. Um, so yeah, what's happening on the platform too, just to mention it is just, there are also people that let's say on Instagram, you went to find them, you know, there's higher level people. Maybe you're an entrepreneur who sells a product that you want to get your foot in the door at a big place that frankly, they probably wouldn't, you can't get their email address. You wouldn't know how to reach them. Mm -hmm. These people are accessible. And at the end of the day, they are people, but the way to access them is through LinkedIn is through that strategy is through reaching out to them in a place where they're expecting it and want, want it, you know, as opposed to trying to, get them on their personal feed on their Instagram or, right. or bombard their assistant. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, um, we are starting to run out of time. There's so much stuff we can talk about, but I have a couple bullet questions. I'd love to see if we can try and rifle through some of them. Sure. Um, okay. Um, what's your favorite platform for video? P posting favorite video. Favorite platform for video right now? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Easily because of the because if you, anybody goes who's not been on LinkedIn, reset your password, go on. <laughs> right now, because everybody's so new, it's not the super polished version of, like if you go to YouTube and you put up something that's, you know, me with my phone, nobody wants to watch that. It needs to be highly produced. Mm -hmm. For people who aren't highly produced and not used to video, LinkedIn is a great place to start because I think right now there's like pushback against the overly produced thing. So raw and real is playing really well. So it's also short, like I'm talking 30 seconds to two minute videos. Okay. So if you are scared, so that for me is somebody who doesn't always love doing video, that's easy. And so that's why LinkedIn's my favorite. And also the algorithm and all the other things I said. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Of, we love LinkedIn for sure. <laughs> you know, um, in terms of content creation on LinkedIn. So we already just talked, we just talked about video. Um, there are things called LinkedIn articles. And then there's something that I think you're a fan of because I see you do it a lot is um, writing a, in the caption or the description box um, as an article. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that too. So from an algorithm standpoint, just to give the free value, 
the best because people always ask what's best for the algorithm the best thing for <laughs> Sorry. the algorithm is to, <laughs> it's funny right the best thing for the algorithm is to vary up your content but for me so another thing i loved about linkedin like i said the friendlier more straightforward algorithm mm -hmm. is there are times where it can be the length of a tweet just text those things have the potential to go viral and i've just never seen like i said the algorithm is so friendly now you can get more reach and engagement than you even have followers or connections so for me i i find it really easy i like writing like i said i'm not so much of a video person like i'm getting more into it mm -hmm. but my intuitive nature is to type something out and so for me a status post is easy and i want people to make it easy on themselves like you only need to be posting a few times a week it's not like instagram where you need to be posting you know five to seven times a you know a week and then, or like a Facebook where you should be posting it three times a day. Right. It's just a low lift. So I love the status update. The benefit of, you know, video is people are hot on video. The benefit of the status update is depending on if your people are at work and they can't listen on headphones or any of that stuff, they can read it quickly. The benefit of articles is that those live on your profile on LinkedIn. So if you have something you want to feature and you, it, it literally lives there when I go to your profile. And just the most important, another tip, most important thing to worry about with LinkedIn right now, if you have to worry about one thing, is your profile, so. Meaning, uh, what, what do you mean by that? Meaning update your profile. That is oh, okay. literally the most important <laughs> thing. Like, don't, and like, at least put a picture up. Right. Why I, mentioned I asked this question to all of our speakers um, because y'all are experts. Y'all are professionals. Y'all are always continuing to learn. That's the, that's, that's how you stay an expert, right? Is that you're always learning, especially in social media. Um, what are a few resources that you use to stay on top besides your own podcast, uh, Beyond Influential? <laughs> so definitely other podcasts in the space. I like uh, Amy Porterfield's podcast a lot. I really like Tim, I mean, Tim Ferriss, it's not so much about social media. It's not necessarily about the internet. It's just about learning from other business people mm -hmm. who are, who I aspire to be like, who have something that I'd want to grow to. So there's, I like Joe Rogan's podcast. I feel like there's always podcasts and other people who, it might not be necessarily the area that you're working in, but there's tidbits to learn because they're successful in those areas. So the reason I do do my podcast and I don't, it's called Beyond Influential, is because of the influencers in every industry. I don't need to talk to someone who does marketing or branding or anything related to it. I can speak to a doctor. And if they've built something interesting, they're going to have interesting advice. Right. But they'll have some nuance that's that's new. For me right now, I've actually gotten really into reading books again. Oh, good. Like really into it. And I've, I need to probably stop reading so much self-development uh, and nonfiction stuff and maybe just read a fiction book now and, then, <laughs> and now and again. But just going back and even looking at some of the, I started reading the success principles by Jack Canfield. A lot of the timeless stuff is timeless for a reason. Mm -hmm. And all of the business cliches you hear are frankly real, but you don't realize it until you start experiencing them. So I've been kind of going back and just, and just creating my own lists of what's working for me, what's not working for me and, and reading a lot more. And of course, spending time online, the best thing to do to, I feel like not from growth, not to grow your own business necessarily, well, I guess it does grow your own business, is studying the people who are your ideal consumer. Like it's, it's different than listening to somebody who is further ahead than you are. It's more like market research. So like I spend time learning from people who know more than me and reading and consuming that kind of content. And then I spend time watching, watching my ideal consumer, watching the people I wanna reach. What are they doing? What are they interested in? Like I'm kind of, constantly in learning and studying mode all the time but i like it well that that makes sense you went to law school so that that makes absolute sense <laughs> that you're always trying to study and learn uh but joking aside i mean that's something that all entrepreneurs should be doing is always there's always going to be a cutting edge every uh, i want to say every year but more like every month i mean so to, to be on top of that even if you don't use what you're learning it's still really important to know that that's there and uh, I think that's huge. So thank you for sharing some of yours. I love Tim Ferriss, by the way, too. I'm not, we're not promoting him, but I, I mean, I like the idea of taking, like you just said, taking uh, 
bits and pieces of the life of an, someone who's an expert. I mean, he did LeBron James. He's not, I mean, yeah, he is an entrepreneur, but you know, we talked about his fitness regimen, you know, and I learned a lot about myself. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not working out like LeBron James, but I mean, I learned a lot about that through that conversation. So, I mean, that's, that's really key is being able to take bits of wherever you're learning from and to apply it in your business or in your personal life. Um, we are unfortunately out of time, but hopefully I'm going to get you back because um, we have a lot more stuff we can talk about. I know we can't, we do. Um, but thank you so much, Brittany. Um, real quick, where can people find you uh, if they want to learn more about the LinkedIn laws or, you know, more about personal branding? So Brittany Crystal, and you probably have the spelling, but B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y and Crystal is spelled K-R-Y-S-T-L-E. And that's BrittanyCrystal.com. And I'm on, I'm at Brittany Crystal on LinkedIn, on Instagram. I made myself really easy to find on the internet. So type that in and you will find me. And I'll I do respond. And I'll definitely add, make sure you're, the correct spelling of your name is in here so that everyone can find the right Brittany Crystal. Um, again, thank you so much. I've learned a ton already from you, and uh, I hope we can get you back in soon. Thank you so much. Shoot me any questions. Awesome. Have a great day.